Thank you, choir. <clears throat> Did you realize that not just one person was playing the piano there? Yeah, on this side, you might have not seen, but let's give a big round to Joy and Jane. And Joy is all traveling around back there. Going normally, to the when the piano sounds like that, normally it's me playing it, right? <laughs> <laughs> Let us pray. <clears throat> Lord of mercy, it has been a week since the Easter celebration. Our church was beautified with flowers, lovely decorations, lots of people, beautiful music. It was the kind of Easter in which we could celebrate. But during this week, we have slumped back to our old ways. The world, which seems to be too much with us, has claimed our soul. Our resurrection faith has become dim. Let the story of Thomas, who wanted more than anything else to see the risen Lord pour into our hearts, reviving our spirits, giving assurance to our souls. Let fear subside. Replace our doubts with certainty in your love and healing mercy. We ask, gracious God, that just as Thomas found his faith when he placed his hands in the wounds of Jesus, may we also find tangible signs of your presence in our lives. Encourage us to seek you with sincerity to touch the scars of the world's pain and find you amidst the brokenness. May our doubts not be a stumbling block, but a step towards a deeper faith. Grant us, O oh God, the courage to live as Easter people in every season. Inspire us to carry the joy of the resurrection into the everyday tasks and the challenging moments of our lives. May the peace of Christ that calmed the fears of the disciples in the upper room, soothe our anxieties and embolden us to be agents of your peace. In the glow of the Easter light, remind us that we are sent forth with the breath of your spirit to forgive, to heal, and to mend. Help us to be your hands and feet in the world reflecting your love and compassion to all. Lord, guide us to be mindful of the less fortunate and all who are suffering. May we extend to them the same grace you have lavishly given us. Increase our generosity, not only in our giving, but in our spirit. Help us to embrace a spirit of humility and gratitude that overflows into acts of kindness and expressions of love. As we navigate the complexities of this world, strengthen our communities in unity and purpose. Draw us closer to each other and to you, knitting us together with the strong cords of love that cannot be broken. Teach us to cherish each other's presence, knowing that together we reflect the full image of Christ to the world. And as we look forward to the promise of your eternal kingdom, keep us steadfast in faith, joyful in hope and untiring in love. May we labor not for our own benefit, but for the glory of your name and the coming of your kingdom. And now as Christ taught us, we pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us all sing United Methodist Hymnal number 475, Come Down, O Love Divine. <laughs> Scripture reading today, I would like to invite Tom Kearns and read today's scripture with us. And today's scripture reading will be from John chapter 20, verses 19 to 31. Good morning. As a side note, I grew up dreading this reading in Sunday school. On the, on the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, 
Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. It was the great theologian Charlie Brown, 72 years ago, who introduced for us the term, good grief. Have you ever thought of grief as being a good thing? You know, it's something we don't like to necessarily talk about. But for me, this is the essential part of what's happening in this post-resurrection appearance with Jesus, with Thomas, with the other disciples. We appreciate Thomas. Yo, Tom, let me talk to that Sunday school teacher of yours. You shouldn't have to be ashamed of being named after that beloved disciple, you know, Tom? Well, John's the beloved disciple because he wrote that about himself. But Thomas is the person who says what they were probably all feeling and thinking anyway. I mean, if we're honest with ourselves, there's this moment where after Easter, we don't know what they're all feeling, that while we know that Jesus appeared to the disciples and spoke peace to them and, and you know, what was present with them, they're still in a locked room. They're still feeling fear. They're still feeling, to some degree, a mystery of what they're now having to go through with the loss. Grief is our heavy feelings plus our heavy thoughts. That's what grief is. What we're feeling and what we're thinking, that which is heavy, that's grief. Sometimes, right, we often associate grief with mourning. Of course, it's part of it, but you know that we grieve not just when we lose someone that we love. We grieve. We grieve. Because what grief is, with our heavy thoughts and our heavy feelings, is also a state of being to where you look back to what was and you realize you can't go back there. Things changed. Now, to some degree, that could be a good thing. That could be good grief. So because we know we cannot go back to there because of this event, and of course, it could be a, a loss of a loved one. It could be... Uh, something that happens in the course of a relationship in your work. It could be a, all sorts of different things that ye, you are grieving, you're feeling heavy thoughts, heavy, heavy feelings about. That's what our grief is. Because when we know that we can't go back there, we often think about what our future will be based upon what happened in what we call grief. And because the future is uncertain, what makes grief good is that while it reminds us that we can't go back there and we don't know what will happen tomorrow, grief is an invitation. Good grief is an invitation to focus on the present, the now. That's why I say we may all be grieving something and not just someone. I think we've kind of misunderstood grief. I know sometimes the general consensus around grief is that there's stages to it. Have you ever heard that? The, you know, the five stages of grief? You, you know, do you get a diploma at the end of the fifth one? 
it sometimes in our minds when we talk about it feels very linear it feels like i go from here and then i go from here and i'm going through the stages and then i reach acceptance and i get a certificate and i'm good to go until you have that thought or that memory or you run into that person you see i think probably the better image for grief is not going to be in stages well yeah we have different expressions and feelings about it but it's not something that you just go through and you're done with. Instead of a line, instead of a stage, it's almost like an infinity symbol. Because the truth is, are we ever going to get over what we think or what we have been told we need to get over? Think of it within the context of losing someone that you love or the context of what you grieve with your heavy feelings with your heavy thoughts because what grief will do is will invite you into the present that you cannot go back to there you don't know what the future will be but now now is the moment when we can acknowledge and engage this is what thomas helps us with because look let's say you know, do you think the disciples were really just like good to go? <laughs> well, you know, that they weren't feeling some things, thinking about some things, you know, that they were uh, still in the meet midst of grief. This is the challenge sometimes when we read the Bible is that we can read a verse and it can go verse to verse, chapter to chapter, and we can forget the amount of time that seems to go by. You know, one verse to the next, that's a week. Well, well what's happening? Well, here's what we know from what John tells us, that of course, when Jesus made the appearance to the disciples, Thomas wasn't there. But when Thomas comes back and he's hanging out with them again, they say, hey, guess what? We've seen the Lord. Now, here comes the acknowledgement of his grief, that unless I see, and this is where we know that to see is to believe, and I've shared with you that if you believe, you will see, Jesus says. If you believe, you will see the glory of God. But we live so much in the I need to see it in order to believe it. We think about doubting Thomas like his doubt is something that is different than his faith. And not that doubt is an essential ingredient of faith of how it makes it a more robust, a fuller experience, the gift of faith is going to come with uh, a little bit of doubt at times, at least if we are honest and acknowledge that with our own selves. This is what he does. Unless I see, I will not believe. And then a week goes by. And let me just take, this is one of my favorite parts of the story. And you may have heard me talk about this before when I talked about Thomas. Uh, maybe last year, we always love talking about Thomas. Thomas is like the, the go-to post-Easter story because uh, it's a beautiful post-resurrection uh, account. I love that John says a week went by after he said that, hey, friends, I don't think like you think. I don't believe like you believe right now. That probably could have been an invitation for them to say, get out. Instead, he's with them. John tells us that Thomas was with the disciples a week later. And don't you wish when you acknowledge your grief, when you say, unless I see, and for Thomas, he was naming the you know, nail scars or the wound in his Jesus' side. When he's naming those things, don't you wish to some degree that Jesus would have shown up you know, in that moment and say, okay, God, I want you to be on my timeline. That when I acknowledge my grief, I want you to show up right then. But what if God's gift to us isn't going to be that he shows up the moment we acknowledge our grief, but says, here's a group of people that are going to welcome you, that are going to say, you still belong here, even though you don't believe exactly like us. They're not going to hold that statement against them. They're going to look at a shared humanity, common experiences to say, hey, we were friends. We can still be friends 
even though you're not where we are right now. Isn't that what the church should be bearing witness to the world today? That even though you may not believe exactly like us, you have a place to belong. Because it might take a week. It might take some time. Even as we acknowledge our need and acknowledge our grief, we believe that in the fullness of Christ's time, he will come. And the best gift are the people in your lives right now that are with you and grieving along with you. Not just those as part of the morning parade, but those that feel as you feel. They're going to think the deep feelings and thoughts that you're sharing in your grief with them. That they know as part of your story, because it might be part of theirs as well, that they can't go back to there, and they don't know what's going to happen then. But right now, we're together. Right now, we're with you. That's the presence of Christ. Now, in Thomas's story, he was able to have the post-resurrected Christ appear. Even though the doors were locked, Jesus showed up and provided what he needed. Thomas not only acknowledged his grief, now it's time for him to engage in it. And for some reason, we don't know why. Right? What good grief will be will be uh, focusing upon the present, acknowledging and naming the need, but also when we're called to engage in good grief, I'm not inviting us to be dwellers, to be those that can't see hope, that even though it's uncertain, there is something about today that will lead us into a hopeful tomorrow in God's love. You engage in it. You don't have to dwell. This is what I mean when I think Thomas says, the hands and the side. I know it's a subtle little thing, but why did he draw upon that? Why those marks? You see, Thomas could have told again the story of all that Christ would have endured that said, I want to see the proof. I want to see the lashes upon his back as he was whipped in Pilate's court. I want to see the marks of the crown of thorns that were placed upon his head. I want to see the purple robe, a sash that was put over his sh shoulders as they mocked him as a king. I want to see the bruise mark or splinters in his shoulder as the wood dug into his skin as he carried a heavy beam called the cross up a mountain. I w he could have dwelled upon all the details of his grief. But he just says, I need the hand and I need the sides. So I wonder, as you think about everything that you're feeling, everything that you're thinking, as you acknowledge that and as you engage in it, what will it be? What are you thinking and what are you feeling? That's our grief. And when we engage in it, what if that's just the simplest of ways? The, easiest of invitations of ways to say, God, it's this. Now, I don't need to go into the whole story. I don't need to think about all the woulda, coulda, shouldas. But can I see your hands? And can I see your side? Here's the thing about Jesus and Thomas in this moment. We're not sure. John never tells us if he actually places his hand. But the invitation's there nonetheless. He says, if this is what you need, then go ahead. Stop doubting and believe. Oh, there he is, doubting Thomas. Okay, okay. You mean honest Thomas? You mean grieving Thomas? You mean confession Thomas? Because we are not sure what happens if he places his hand there or not, or if that was just going to be enough to where he makes a proclamation of Jesus not being just Lord, but being his God in this moment. Which from the Gospel of John is a pretty unique thing. An introductory thing. Thomas is the one who proclaims in this story that Jesus is not just one with the Father, and the Father and him are one. Jesus 
is God. But he says he's mine. So when we acknowledge, when we engage in good grief, you know that this isn't just something that you might get over. It isn't about getting over. It's about how will my feelings, my thoughts, invite me into the moment of now where I discover yet again God's faithfulness, God's goodness, God's willingness to meet my need with an invitation to provide, you know, sure, go ahead if this is what you need, then to do it, or to provide a, a group of people that would say, we'll let you stay day after day after day until you get what you need from God. Now, why is it that we tell this story every year? You know, why do we keep talking about doubting Thomas? So many times we talk about it as, as if it's different, doubt and faith, because we like the bifurcation, we like the, the duality of things. Oh, there's doubt and then there's faith. There's joy and then there's sorrow. Sorrow might last for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Like it's a 24-hour cycle? Or how long is the night in the dark night of our soul before the light of the dawn breaks in. It might not be a couple hours. Would it be day after day after day? Do you have a group of people in your life that are saying, you can stay with us in this room until God gives you what you need? You are welcome here today, friends, in this church. This is a room where, hey, I may not think like you think. I may not even believe exactly like you believe because I need, maybe like Thomas, I need to know from a firsthand experience I don't want to believe just because you said it or just because you told me. I want to receive what only God can give me. So I don't know if I'm with you on this quite yet. That's God's gift of faith. When we as God's people say, okay, okay, we'll see together. We may see it in a different time but we'll see it because yes, seeing is believing, but I bet if we believe together, we will begin to see. We will see not only as Jesus said, the glory of God, but we will receive a blessing as Jesus said, for blessed are those who have not seen and yet have still believed. So over the next couple weeks, we're gonna talk more in detail about what it means to see. Thomas says, unless I see, and here's Christ again, that says, here I am. If this is what you need, then place your hand in my side. So as you acknowledge your grief, your heavy thoughts, your heavy feelings, as you acknowledge it, as you engage in it, will you see him? And see that he's come to you. Let us pray. Lord, as we prepare to come to this table of grace, open our eyes to see. Open our hearts to receive what you desire to give. But first we name it. We acknowledge it. We engage. We're thinking some things. We're feeling some things, and it's heavy. Sometimes when we see that person, sometimes when we go down that street, sometimes when we see that thing, sometimes when we remember, here it comes. We can't go back. We don't know what tomorrow will be, so now we humbly ask, would you meet with us? Would you see us? Would you help us? to see you. So children of God, acknowledge, engage, and let that which you grieve be good, as we have a good God, faithful, one who is compassionate, abounding in steadfast love, slow to anger, rich in mercy. 
and in this grace and in this life because we believe we have life in his name. Lord, hear our prayers. Hear our acknowledgement. Hear our engagement as we come to this table. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As you came in today, you may have received the elements for communion on the table. And if you were busy getting a cup of coffee or a whoopie pie, that's okay, because I did the same thing. I got my coffee. So, but our ushers are available. Thank you, Judy, that if you need the elements for communion, just raise your hand real quick and we'll make sure that, uh, thank you, Erica. Make sure everybody has communion as we come to this table. For our friends that are worshiping online with us live right now, or maybe you're watching it later today or into the week, if you wanted to grab bread or crackers or juice or water also, you are welcome at this table. There was another post-resurrection experience where Jesus was walking with disciples that were on their way to a place called Emmaus. And they were talking about the news of the day and Jesus asked, you know, well, what's going on? And they said, man, have you been living under a rock? Don't you know what's going on? There was this guy named Jesus of Nazareth. We had hoped that he was going to be the hoped for Messiah. And, you, you know, it didn't work out probably like we thought it was because he was handed over to the religious leaders, the chief priests. They crucified him. And Jesus uh, says, well, didn't the prophets kind of like talk about that? Let's talk about this. See, Jesus was walking alongside of them, but they didn't know it was him. They make it to their destination. And he's about to leave and they say, no, 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 come on, let's sit down and have a meal together. Come on, let's, let's have a little dinner. You got to be tired from walking like us. Come on, stay with us. And Jesus takes bread and he breaks it. And it's that moment as he breaks the bread in their presence that their eyes were opened and they saw him. And they realized, were not our hearts burning along the road as he opened the scriptures to us? I love that part of the post-resurrection account. I love, of course, the Thomas story and Jesus showing up in the room. But I also love the moment where you feel like you're on this journey and you're pouring out your heart and you're trying to say, this is what I had hoped would have happened. You're naming your grief. You're acknowledging your stuff. And you're saying, God, don't you know? Where are you in this? Only to discover. It's been him the whole time. There's something about when we share in this bread. This is our hope for communion today, that you'll see him because he has something for you. This is good news that in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Would you please join me and Pastor Kim in our communion liturgy. It's what we call the great thanksgiving. The words should be on our screen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right. It's a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, brought us to a land flowing with milk and honey, and set before us the way of life. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna in the highest. 
blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, by the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection you gave birth to your church delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the spirit by your great mercy we have been born anew to a living hope through the resurrection of your son from the dead and to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. Once we were no people, but now we are your people, declaring your wonderful deeds in Christ, who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and the Holy Spirit. On the night of which Jesus gave himself for us, he took bread, gave thanks to God, and broke it, shared it with his disciples, and said, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. And do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, and gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts of Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. No sun in the highest, O sun in the highest, O sun in the highest. Let us pray. Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here on these gifts of bread and juice. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. We want to see. We want to believe. We believe. Help us to see. In the midst of all of our unbelief, Lord, help. We thank you that we can see you in the breaking of the bread. Open our eyes to see your grace, the mystery of your presence, and what you have for us in this holy meal. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet table. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Church, may honor and glory be yours, Almighty God, now and forevermore. Amen, amen, amen. No sound in the highest, O sound in the highest, O Sanna in the highest. As
as God's children today, you are welcome to share at this table of grace. Together, as we share in the bread, children of God, this is the body of Christ. Take and eat in remembrance of him. Amen. Children of God, this is the blood of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of our sins. As we drink, let us remember who Jesus is and thank Jesus for his grace to be poured upon to our lives. Let us drink. Let us pray. Christ, you have invited us to pray for daily bread, for a sufficiency of grace in this moment. You provide what we need today, right now. We know that we can't go back. We know that the future still might be uncertain. But we know and have hope because of your presence with us today. We thank you for the mystery of the bread and the cup that remind us of your grace and life. Hear our prayers. And we give you all the praise and the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let me invite for our ushers to come at this time as we continue in our worship as we present to God our tithe and offerings. You are our Lord and our God today. We have received your peace. We have received your gift. We share these gifts in faith and in trust, knowing that as the Apostle Thomas was able to travel to the ends of the earth, so our mission and ministry can make a difference in the lives, not just here, but even to the ends of the earth. We pray a blessing not only for those to receive these gifts, but for those that have given them in faith, in sacrifice, in surrender. Bless these gifts and those that give them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite you, if you're able, to please remain standing and we'll sing our closing Let us all sing number 672, and we will sing verses 1 and 2. God be with you. 
till we meet again. By his counsels guide uphold you with his sheep securely fold you. God be with me till we meet again. Till we meet, till we meet, till we meet at Jesus' feet. Till we meet, till we meet, God be with you till we meet again. God be with you till we meet again. Neath his wings securely hide you. Daily manna still provide you. God, we with you till we meet again. Till we meet, till we meet, till we meet at Jesus' feet. Till we meet. Till we meet, God be with you till we meet again. Jesus gave a word of sending and blessing to his disciples. That story in uh, John chapter 20 with Thomas. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you, he said. So we hear those words again of his call for us to be sent ones. So children of God, go with grace and peace. Remember that you are not sent here for yourselves, but you are sent for others. And our world waits for you. Amen. Amen.